I value my country, I care for it, I love it, but I'm not going to simply follow whoever is in power and give them the right to define what patriotism is, what nationalism is, what the good for the country is. Welcome to the Conservative Curious Podcast, where we uncover niche thinkers at the intersection of philosophy, tech, and culture. I'm your host, Jessica Dang, alongside my friend and co-host, Ani Pai. In this episode, we talk to Anthony Hennon, co-founder of Expatilations, an Appalachia-focused journalism project. He's also the managing editor for the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal, a higher ed think tank in Raleigh, North Carolina. With his upbringing in Appalachia and time spent living in the Czech Republic, Anthony has interesting insights about the rise of regionalism. We talk about how the pandemic has spurred regional packs in the U.S., the dilution of communities, the proliferation of digital tribes, the cultural impacts of a nation, and his case for the EU. I think in general, there is a huge push toward regionalism in the United States. I was recently listening to Chamath Palihapitiya, who, you know, started Social Capital, the venture firm, but previously led growth at Facebook. And he was talking about how it's basically destined at this point that the United States forms these blocks. And then, you know, regulation in the West Coast is obviously very different than regulation in the East Coast. But then you can imagine that just to the next level where like states choose who to work with in these blocks and they're probably going to be just like Europe. Northern Europe is like the most productive as you get closer and closer to the South. It's like, you know, sangria all day and naps in the evening. And I think that's happening here too. Yeah, I I think there's throughout American history, there's been this constant push pull between nationalism and regionalism and localism. I, I would very much welcome this kind of more regional approach, um, partially because I think it's an improvement in going back to these federalism roots where, you know, states can experiment differently. And, you know, we don't all have to live under the same political arrangements, under the same economic arrangements. Even during the pandemic, you know, you saw these kind of regional consortiums of, you know, uh, New York and New Jersey will form a pact where, you know, People can come in and travel there without quarantining, whereas if you're far off or if you're not taking you know, health measures as seriously as they are, then you might have to quarantine for a few weeks. So th- I, I think there's a lot of disparate reasons why we're seeing kind of a, a renewed push for regionalism. You know, if, if states aren't going to blaze their own path, I think at least breaking up into separate regions to kind of pursue different goals is important. When you erase those local bonds, those state level bonds, those regional bonds, it's much easier for you know the powerful or the strongest or the most influential to deliberately or not erase any sort of local connections or of any sense of like history or uh, philosophy. It's so funny because you're talking about you know like creating a blank slate, and I feel like that's kind of what's happening right now on a national level. There is this push to like create a blank slate because we don't really like what the past was. I think that it comes from generalizing and from not necessarily understanding the complexity of the past. I think even looking back at um, basically time between the Civil War and World War I, one of the big things in American literature was this kind of American regional uh, realism that took the shape of local caller stories or of regional stories where, you know, Mark Twain was big on this, e- even uh, um, I'm blanking on this, uh, Uncle Tom's ca- uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, she also wrote in this vein, you had a lot of these writers where they would basically look at where they lived in, you know, Eastern and Western Massachusetts, um, out West on the frontier, um, down South, all over the place and kind of look at what is unique to this region, what kind what kind of character or what kind of person do these regional these local values produce? Um, you know, th- this idea of, you know, the, this uh, archetype of, you know, the Yankee or the Southerner or the pioneer or the frontiersman, the coal miner, um, the logger. I mean, there's all there's dozens of these kinds of characters, um, which the the worst vein of this could, you know, just be reduced into stereotyping. Um, which often came out when you had white writers writing about, you know, slaves or recently freed black people, uh, which is an ugly mark on the past, but that's how the past is. The past is complex. 
without understanding how the people of the past viewed themselves, how they viewed their local areas, I think it's harder to craft, you know, a more positive image of it or to, you know, to give your community or give your children any sense of what came before them and of the importance of being involved in your local community. This overarching issue for me is, you know, we're losing the sense of local identity or regional identity to either, you know, on the right, this tendency toward nationalism or on the left, this tendency toward, you know, humanitarianism and global citizenship, which, you know, both are trading on generalizations and, and idealism, which I think is another danger, especially for global citizens, for this image of global citizens. It's very general. It's very idealistic. It sounds very, you know, humanist or whatever, but it's not really, it's not really crafting any sort of local attachment. It's not giving any duty or responsibility to people. You know, the the emphasis is on this idea of caring for all of humanity, you know, for trying to, you know, th- think about the entire world rather than your local area, which is good to the extent that it makes you think beyond, oh, you know, we should go bomb these people because we think they did a bad thing here. Um, you know, this restraint of nationalism, I, I think is, can be a good part of global citizenship. But when you get to the root of it, Global citizenship doesn't mean anything. Being a citizen carries rights, it carries duties, it carries responsibilities. And you can't have that on a global scale. Um, It also reduces your interest in what's actually going on around you. It doesn't really push this idea that you need to be involved in your neighborhood. You need to take care of your neighbor. Um, Like the uh, uh, Klaus Wren, who is an academic um, at the... Catholic University of America in DC, one of his big things is this idea that the constant, what he calls the constitutional personality of, you know, kind of the character of a people that makes a country um, function. It's based on this idea rooted in Christianity of loving your neighbor. And it's not, you know, loving humanity. It's not loving the world. It's loving your neighbor, which means taking care of the people around you. It's not generalized. It's not idealized. It's messy. It makes you put in the work. It makes you see people in all their complexity rather than just imagining imagining them as these kind of faceless moral weights, moral characters. You have to actually put in the work. Whereas with global citizenship, it's this idea of, oh, you know, we need to think broadly and we need to care about humanity, but it doesn't actually push you to take any action. It might influence who you're voting for or, you know, kind of the the type of media you might read or consume, but it's not really pushing you to take any sort of moral, moral responsibility. And, you know, Rin sees that as very dangerous on a political level, but I think it's also a danger on a moral level. And it's also a danger in terms of actually building a half decent society where you live. Um, yeah, neoliberalism to me in that lens has actually been probably one of the biggest shams of the last 50, 60 years, because it's pretty obvious that it's all about, you know, eroding the community. And when you have no community, what are you going to do besides buy stuff? Consumerism is a religion, but then at every step, it's like, okay, we don't believe in God anymore. If you don't have that, and now you don't believe in your country anymore, right? Which mm-hmm. which is the 1619 project and reshaping that. And then at the same time, this next and last step is like destroying where you even come from, right? Wherever you grew up, that region that you grew up in is also destroyed. So it's like, what do you expect people to do? And that zeal doesn't actually go away. And I think it's a mistake to kind of think just by destroying the idea of community that our desire for it goes away, which I don't think is true. I mean, I just think we find it in online forums or we're going to find it in Facebook or Instagram or something else. And we just shift that around. But it's not about, you know, thinking about what are my ancestors like? What is the community I was brought up in? What are the values that I have? Because that's so opposite business. As we've cut off these local connections or this emphasis on community or trying to improve it, uh, we also have completely butchered the use of community. I mean, everything is a community now, you know, the global community, you know, we're all part of the, you know, evil corporate community or whatever the name is. It's not just benefits with the community. Things are messy. You know, a lot of communities in the past in the U.S. have been very repressive, very backwards, very awful for a lot of people dubbed outside the community. When we have such this amorphous, inaccurate use of the term community, it becomes easier to demonize the past rather than seeing that as awful as this this is, this is what we come from and we need to work toward improving that. Instead, it becomes there's no 
way to save this. There's no, you know, there's no forgiveness or no mercy with this. We need to clear this off and start something new, or we need to just teach people about the negative aspects of it. And I think the more you do that over time, the more corrosive that effect is because then people don't want to invest in their community. They don't want to invest in, you know, taking their ind- individual energy or effort and invest it into s- some institution that'll be long around longer than they are. I saw this New York Times article where they were basically saying that the EU now represents the new world and the U.S. represents the old world because the U.S. hasn't evolved past its founding ideals, whereas now the EU is, you know, this project of peace. With the rise of Brexit and uh, the rise of nationalism, populism, like, what are your thoughts on that? So I always go back and forth on the EU because it's it's like it's a dumpster fire, but like it's a dumpster fire that's better than, you know, a house fire. There's always a quick dismissal of the EU as, you know, this this top-down socialistic bureaucracy that's crushing Europe um, and seeing, you know, Brexit as this shining light, um, which kind of rings true. I mean, the EU is a bunch of like socialist bureaucrats who don't do a lot of good things. But on the flip side, I think the strongest argument coming from the right for the EU comes from um, Dalibor Rohach, who is, uh, I think is affiliated with the American Enterprise Institute now. But in 2016, he wrote a book called Towards an Imperfect Union, which is basically a conservative defense of the e- of the EU. His broad idea is kind of tying back toward, um, you know, F.A. Hayek in the 40s also wrote a case for uh, European federalism. Winston Churchill, with his United States of Europe speech, also talked about this of, you know, a federal Europe doesn't necessarily need to be this awful socialist bureaucracy. It can also be a sign of strength in terms of improving political inter- interdependency, improving economic ties, uh, because, you know, economic interdependence can be a very big, um, very big uh, way to make sure that you don't bomb each other. But, you know, people, politicians, nations are irrational. That's not always going to hold up. Um so Rohatch's kind of broad idea is that compared to the alternatives of having, you know, these rising national states in Europe, a federation in Europe is a much stronger ideal because it gives it, it puts pressure on diplomacy to solve problems. It does a good job of connecting people. It does a good job of making sure that people can travel to one state or another and make sure to keep um, protectionist laws low um, because Broadly, it's better. And there's other ways that you can essentially help out the areas that might uh, lose from this broader, you know, free trade, free migration. Because when you look at the EU now, in terms of a lot of trade, a lot of goods crossing, it's very interconnected. You know, you're getting, you know, you're getting produce from Bulgaria shipped up to the UK. You're getting German manufactured goods coming down into, you know, Southern Europe, all this stuff. Um, but one of the bigger problems the EU has is actually making services do the same. Generally, services, you know, if, if you're offering service in Germany, you're basically catering to Germans, maybe to, you know, the Swiss or other people who speak German. But there's not a lot of um, services crossing borders, whereas goods are. The New York Times piece misses on two things fundamentally, both politically and economically. So politically, it misses the fact that the EU which is a supposed area of peace is held together by the American military. Mm-hmm. Like uh, one thing you realize when you live in Europe is that nobody actually likes each other. Mm-hmm. And it's not that it's not a function of human nature that people get more, more nicer over time. That doesn't happen. Like if anything, the Germans don't want to conquer all of Europe. French people just want to be left alone and eat baguettes. Like the U people in, you know, like in England just want to watch football and that's completely fine, but we can't make the mistake that like somehow they're more evolved than America because if anything, it's only held together by America. And the other funny part is that like it has the second oldest demographic in the world, right? So the only reason Europe exists for now is because Americans buy their goods. In both of those cases, you can kind of see that it's like without America, Europe would already have, you know, split the, had the balkanization that happened in Eastern Europe in the eighties, but we just prolonged it for 20 years. Yeah. I, I think people vastly overestimate the, uh, 
global citizenship view that a lot of average Europeans have. Even even in Hungary, Viktor Orban's kind of push to grant citizenship to Hungarians living in Transylvania. You know, there's still backbiting and revanchism, and you know, fighting over what you know who owns Transylvania, who owns you know Kosovo. I mean, there's all these little spots still within Europe. Um, I think that's a mistake that Americans make, where you know, an American federal system is much easier to parse because there's a national identity and there's a lot of variety in states or regions. Whereas in Europe, you know, there's very little fealty to this idea of being European. It's very tied into being Romanian or British, obviously, or French. You know, right. the, the the elite, not so much. You know, the elite, it's, you know, going from Brussels to Berlin to London to Barcelona. I mean, all these places, it's not as tied in. But when you actually talk to people on the ground, I mean, there's still a lot of bad blood, unsettled issues on the scale that the U.S. doesn't have you know, I, I don't think we're going to see Virginia invade West Virginia again or see uh, Michigan try to take Toledo back. You know, whereas, you know, with, you know, give or take how you're defining it, 50, 60 years in Europe of, of, uh, of peace, that is not the norm in Europe. That's barely the norm of modern Europe. Um, and the EU has a role to play in tamping down those flare ups. But it also walks a thin line of actually having that legitimacy in the eyes of the people. You know, I, I think if I'm mean, obviously I'll say this because I'm American, but I, I think a federation of Europe with similar ideals and identities and you know attachments as Americans have would be uh, much more functioning than what they have now. But if you simply get rid of the EU and return to you know a continent of nation states fighting it out, historically that has not gone well for Europe or for a lot of world stability. And I think people really when they criticize the EU or they want to get rid of it, they're undervaluing that. Where if we if we abolish the EU, we're going to have a lot more problems than keeping it around. And the route to me is reforming the EU and figuring out what sort of federation would retain legitimacy and ideally sure. not require billions of US dollars in keeping the military peace. I'm reminded of uh, Teal's three scenarios for the future of Western Europe. The first being the Danish socialism version of playing ultimate frisbee every day and not working. The second is the Islamic authoritarianism that if you're familiar with Douglas, Douglas Murray's work, The Strange Death of Europe, where they lied and exaggerated the refugee problem to bring in even more immigrants, therefore cheap labor into England uh, in the year of 2015. And, you know, just during the refugee crisis, that's the second scenario. And the third is uh, Chinese authoritarianism. You're already seeing that in places like Germany, right? With the Green Party, and then it's the far right. And that's like the split. Like you see the same in, in the Netherlands, right? Mm -hmm. It's either far right or it's incredibly alt left and the socialism there. What do you think about that with respect to uh, this idea of regionalism and nationalism? Yeah, I, I think that also highlights the, you know, the binary of you're either with kind of this, you know, global citizenship model or you're a far right um, reactionary where, you know, I, I think that comes, at least in the US, some of that is, you know, we see Europeans freaking out about Syrians coming in or, or any sort of Muslim refugee or Africans, and we just uh, graft our own model of race relations and everything else on it. But we also don't realize that the British were also freaked out about Romanians coming and Poles. It's not, you know, it's not just Syrians and Turks and Bengalis that they resent. It's everybody, you know, it's, it's those kind of regional rivalries. Um I think this also taps into the early 20th century in the U.S. when we're kind of these debates of, you know, is, is America a melting pot? Um, is it, you know, a patchwork of different nationalities? Um, this uh, philosopher named Horace Callan, who was taught at Harvard, was based out in the University of Wisconsin for a while. He had this concept of cultural pluralism, which was essentially envisioning America as Europe without like the backbiting and the identities and basically being able to form these ethnic communities without, you know, the bad blood back in the old world you had of, you know, all, all those old rivalries where those weren't really coming over to the U.S. because we had so much space. Um, you could form your own ethnic enclaves and, you know, live your own life and you could still come together and be an American. He tied that concept much more into this um, ethnic identity as compared to the kind of the you know, multiculturalism of today, which I don't think really delivers the goods on a lot of different issues in terms of identity and actually having some sort of national unity. It, it's hard to say with Europe because on one aspect, which I think we're also seeing in the US, there's not really this willingness to state 
what you know the positives of having a national identity or the positives of having a bunch of regions in your country it's much more highlighting these negative aspects of it focusing on you know any opposition is obviously just hiding behind racism which some of it is i'm fine with calling europe a garbage continent that's dominated by racism in a way that the us is not you know i will not pump the brakes on that um but i think this kind of reactionary push toward nationalism is also a problem of you know, you might be able to do that to a certain extent in, you know, in England, where it's still what ninety percent white, I think. But that's not going to fly in a place like Spain, where it has, you know, what I think it's twelve or thirteen different regions. Um, and when Spaniards tried to kind of suppress that and have this national Spanish identity under Franco, uh, that's how you got, you know, even more antagonisms. So that's how you got terrorism going on. And you know, there's not really. There's only so much you can push into a box without it bursting. I, I think one of the biggest threats to the EU's legitimacy is trying to push this idea that everything has to look the same. Um, I think it's one thing to lower you know, trade barriers. It's one thing to lower being able to travel from country to country without going through passport checks. But again, you know, the American identity cannot simply be grafted onto the European identity and treated as something legitimate or national. Um, there's still a lot of infighting going on and there's a lot of resentment that will bubble up as you see in you know the support for Viktor Orban in Hungary or in uh, Poland with the Law and Justice Party of uh, there's a lot of resentment from Central and Eastern Europe of you know this idea we joined the EU because we viewed it as this country that was peaceful that respected the countries within it that could actually you know allow us to operate within our, with our, as we see fit without dominating us as the EU gets more micromanaged, as it, you know, tries to pass all these regulations on the level of the EU parliament or just as run by bureaucrats, a lot of people who were sold on this idea of the EU as a democratic federation aren't going to buy into it. A lot of these post-communist states saw the value of entering into the European Union as being a part of, you know, the European identity. They did not go into it with this idea of becoming just like Germany or of ceding their sovereignty, or of giving up on, you know, being able to do business as they see fit or live their lives as they see fit. Do you think there's a difference between nationalism and patriotism and that there are people who just get the two mixed up? The way I see it is nationalism is much more a call toward, you know, respecting the the power that's running currently or the status quo Whereas patriotism is much more a sense of, you know, local, regional, national attachment, but you're not willing to go into it regardless of, you know, what the political system is doing. I value my country. I care for it. I love it. But I'm not going to simply follow whoever's in power and give them the right to define what patriotism is, what nationalism is, what the good for the country is. So I, I think it's a constant push-pull. I, I think a lot of people will be ba- basically defining nationalism as anything I don't like and patriotism as anything I do like. And I, I think to a certain extent it can be useful as that, but it would be useful if there was much more of a uh, wider agreement on how to define nationalism versus patriotism. I think patriotism in Europe is kind of anachronistic simply because like what should they be patriotic about, right? What values do they embody that makes you happy that you are, let's say, Dutch, right? I mean, fundamentally, the average Dutch person feels like they've been like sold out by the government, by the special business interests. Whereas I think if you're American, this is why I think a lot of people don't understand why Americans are patriotic. It's kind of because historically, the buck has stopped with America, right? Like when something needed to get done, no one looked to England to get it done in like the last 60 years or Amsterdam or you know, anyone else. It was like fundamentally American. It's so difficult to talk about this in terms of Europe as a whole, because I mean, it varies widely. I mean, you know, Catalan nationalists are very patriotic, but not necessarily Spanish. But I I think it's also kind of those beneficial aspects of nationalism um, in Europe are not necessarily expressed in the same way as they are in the US. A better parallel for the US um, in terms of patriotism, nationalism, and a whole host of other issues, is looking at Russia. Um, because Russia is, at points, diametrically the opposite of the U.S., but at other points, it is right in line. And I, I think that's a vein 
that people would find it well worth their time to dig into of kind of looking at these similarities and differences between the US and Russia, um, especially on kind of these ideas of national identity. But that's also because Russia has such strong homegrown talent, right? Like across the entire cultural stack, I'd say, across your art, architecture, its history is also fundamentally opposed to that of Western Europe, right? I mean, that split happened during the Mongol invasion, where I think Kublai Khan took over Russia, but then uh, Genghis's other kids took over Europe, and you know they were like meshed together, and that was a big thing there. But Russia was always kind of left alone, right? It, it would just go off and do its own thing, and it had different enemies than most of Europe at the same time. The Russian mindset is is one of cynicism on the surface, but optimism underneath. It's a vast, contradictory place in some similar ways as the U.S., um, and also just in terms of. It's expansion, you know, it's going, it's going east. A lot of, I mean, some of the areas it didn't even uh, properly integrate into the Russian Empire or the USSR until I think the 1950s, basically. Um, and I think that has parallels with the US in terms of how we expanded across the continent and then, you know, around the world up, you know, the Philippines and Puerto Rico, everywhere else. It, it's complicated because again, we're operating on generalities and talking about national identity and that presents the danger of, you know, erasing significant groups of getting people to think in these binary ways. But it's also funny because if you have these regions that are not getting along, then nationalism would be a good unifying. Uh, I yeah, I, I think it can and it can't. I mean, I, I think if you're thinking of the American idea of e pluribus unum, of you know, out of one many and being able to bring a vast groups of people together in one sense, that's great. But on the flip side, nationalism can also result into you know, you killing anyone who doesn't apply um, or fall into the category you have of what the nation is. You know, those are obviously kind of the extremes here, but I think that does filter into when are you using nationalism as a way to identify people in a way that helps them flourish and live a better life and make a broader society function better? And when are you casting them aside and exploiting them or making their lives harder? I think that's also one of the problems with the EU of you're not going to have necessarily st this dedication to it. You can see a lot of people going to die for their country, but it's much harder to see them go and die for the EU as this broad image or ideal of global citizenship, of you know humanitarianism. So I, I think that that's also part of why I'm more and more interested in localism and in regionalism, because then you're confronted with you know this mixture of people under one country, under one banner. You can look at this and be like, okay, there's a lot going on here and we need to expand this idea of like one type of American or one type of Russian or one type of German. You have to expand that into, you know, certain archetypes that all fall under the umbrella of being American, being Russian. I definitely felt English when, when I lived in England. I've never felt that. And I definitely felt I could feel the Russian seeping into me when I was there for a while. England is way more on the left among young people, I'd say, in compared to America, whereas Russia, you really do feel the presence of God when you're there. I was in Moscow, and I really felt uh, some pull when I was there, too. What I find with the Russian people, and I don't know if it's because of the post-communist, like, it definitely feels like they've been through something, they're very proud of their history. It's a very, like, poetic and very romantic kind of... Uh, a feeling when I was there. Definitely Moscow, St. Petersburg have that influence in history, right? Where certain locations have this runaway impact on, I mean, Leningrad, right? Like to anyone who's interested in progress, you kind of have to be there to just see like, this was the place where, you know, it went down. I, I think it's also a reflection of, you know, the influence of cities and kind of what they can do to bring people together and build up, you know, either cultural influence, you know, economic effects, political effects, um, or just kind of this sense of identity. I mean, I'm Prague had a sim similar fate of sorts in the interwar period. I mean, you know, Vienna before uh, the, the fall of the empire was, you know, a notorious hub for kind of bringing all sorts of people together and creating something lasting. Um, I, I think that all just feeds into, you know, the importance of having these hubs and having, some sort of identity that comes from it or, you know, having a group of people together to challenge it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that all, that's also kind of why it's harder for, you know, Appalachia to craft some sort of national consciousness of an identity or even an identity within itself as compared to, you know, 
California with San Francisco and LA and all these other cities or, you know, New York with New York city, obviously. And, you know, you kind of, you need those hubs to bring people together and actually create something, which I mean, you know, it's, it can still pop out of, you know, these small, you know, rural towns or areas. I mean, that's essentially what happened early on in the U S I mean, Philadelphia was what I think 30,000 people by the time Ben, Ben Franklin got there. So, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily take a huge towering global city to do these sorts of things, but there is some sort of uh, magic in a culture that can be created in these uh, tight knit places. I mean, I hope that, you know, we'll be able to just illuminate these regional and local histories um, and not tear it down and not start with a blank slate because then you'll see people talking about American culture as just like, people lumbering around Walmart or something. And then you kind of forget like this, that there was a a history. Uh, I lost it myself. Uh, You know, growing up in Texas, I felt really proud to be a Texan. Um, And I don't know, I don't know if it's just the times or what, but that's kind of all kind of faded away. The real part that people understand now is, especially when we talked about Europe is, I would always say like Silicon Valley and people would always know what that meant. And I think that's simply because of the fact that all the talk about America in the EU, especially the more educated one is, is about Facebook regulation, Google regulation. And every time you open the paper, it's like 500 billion, like 500 million fine for Apple, 5 billion fine for Facebook and everything else. Even when you think about the cultural impact of New York has has seemed to fall away in the face of like, technology and tech localism and like this digital nat- nationalism that we see and digital tribes forming up. Mm-hmm. It, it's almost a weird, weird situation where the past 40, 50 years, at least in the U S people are moving less than they used to a couple of generations ago where there's not as much m- mobility. Um, but at the same time, you're getting more economic, political, social, cultural, artistic power conglomerating in, you know, the big cities in DC and New York, San Francisco, LA, you know, and so people are still relatively rooted, especially compared to the past, but there's not as strong of an emphasis on regional identity or local identity. Um, and I, I think part of that comes from this idea of that, you know, these mega cities are hoovering up, you know, kind of the top talent that might otherwise stick around the more that, you know, we've kind of taken on, this national culture, this national focus, that's dried up. I don't even think about those other places in America, which is really sad. Yeah, West Virginia has a similar GDP to that of France. People get paid peanuts in Europe, yet its cultural impact per GDP is... I mean, France to me actually is not even the France of even five years ago or 10 years ago. Like it's fallen so fast to the decline and fall of uh, France. I mean, probably Mitterrand and they all would be crying if they were here right now. I mean, I'm definitely crying inside. In that sense, I kind of think that we are actually, you know, way above the notch. I mean, that's like economically, I'm not talking about culturally, even in the flyover states, but uh, it's hilarious to me to think that, you know, in the media where it's portrayed as, you know, deplorables, Trump supporters, like the lowest of the low, they have a standard of living that's perhaps better than what you know, your average American would think of as classy, classy France. Mm -hmm. You know, what's also weird, you're so right about like France having this cultural impact. I think it's weird when a nation has no national identity, like Canada. Canadian national identity is tricky, though, I think, especially for us being American, where we're so used to having, you know, these are our ideals. This is our history. This is what we stand for. This is our art. Look at all these great things we've given the world. That is not a good uh, platform for us to understand a country that is not necessarily so bombastic and are much more subtle in what they do. Um, I mean, like I've, I've been up to Canada a couple times, but only in um, cities for the most part. But I mean, you know, it feels different from the U.S. It feels like a cousin of the U.S. almost in a similar way that it feels when I've been to the U.K. or Ireland. But I mean, there's definitely a sense of national identity. But I also think Canadians, Canadian national identity, to a certain extent, um, identifies itself against the U.S. And so the ways that we express it are not necessarily, they're not going to look for um, their own version of that. They're going to be more liable to go in a different direction entirely. And I think it's harder for us to pick up on it unless the Canadian very explicitly and clearly explains it to us. 
like not to rag on Canada, but I had a Canadian friend um, and I, I was just like, I don't understand what Canada stands for. The image is not really powerful to me. And he was just like, okay, picture this, a caribou wearing Ray-Bans. <laughs> and I'm like, that's your national identity? Well, are we moving towards regionalism or nationalism? What say you? Thanks for listening. We hope you like this episode. To read Anthony's writing, visit anthonyhennon.com. For exclusive content and special invitations, become our friend and subscribe at conservativecurious.com. Until next time, stay curious. What do you think, Jess? I think we have some strong, strong talking points here. Actually, arguably, it could be parts of it could could be too strong that we might have to take it out <laughs> and put it in the boat.